glaciers. I kind of covered most of the stuff I wanted to on groundwater as far as water in the subsurface and moving on the subsurface. But I want to talk about one particular type of feature that you probably associate with, with groundwater more than you realize, and that's the idea of caves. And caves are part of a uh, landform development known as karst topography, K-A-R-S-T. And most of this is a chemical solution, chemical weathering. It happens primarily in limestone type of terrains where that limestone can dissolve with a little acidic water and fractures dissolve out and caves form and underground river systems kind of take advantage of these uh, dissolved pathways. Karst is, is a Polish term actually. A lot of this type of topography occurs over in the Polish, Romania, the Balkan area. This is very typically developed over there. And that's where a lot of the early science of studying these type of landscape systems developed. So a lot of the terminology tends to be uh, of Polish origin. It's kind of uh, a little different uh, terms than you're probably used to hear. But it involves all these kinds of features. Uh, on the surface, we see things like natural bridges, we see sinkholes, we see streams that just disappear into the subsurface. We see springs that just kind of pop out of nowhere. Uh, we have what we call blind valleys, where the valleys are eroded back up, and then just all of a sudden ends at a wall. Like, whoa, what happened? So we have some very distinct types of surface features. <coughs> but we also have cave systems and underground streams, and stalactites, stalagmites, all that kind of stuff down in the cave systems. Some things that you may have kind of already seen and explored a little bit on your own. Ah, flicker time. So let's go back to, to our last lecture, believe it or not, a week ago, uh, and true or false. Agriculture uses the most groundwater of any single water use. In 15 seconds. gallons per day each one of us uses. So you kind of don't think of agriculture as the big kahuna of water use. But agriculture uses over 40% of the groundwater usage. So a lot of farming uh, is dependent on groundwater irrigation. A little, a little different than you might intuitively guess. Okay, let's look at some karst topography. Um, we're not going to have much karst topography uh, in areas where we have sandstones, where we have igneous basalts or igneous rocks. Uh, this is going to be primarily uh, occurring in areas where we have limestone, something to dissolve. And it's going to be really prevalent in areas where it's warm, where those dissolving chemical reactions speed up with water and temperature. So places like Florida are a really good place to have uh, problems with karst topography. And on the surface, you can see that. Here's frost-proof Florida. And yes, they do get frosts there. They were just doing a little advertising when they named the town. And this guy built his house. And in 1991, the thing just sinks into a sinkhole. It just opens up, and the whole house collapses. Could he put it in a worse place? Karma. Probably not. <laughs> Karma. He did something bad in the previous life, right? Oh my God. But there was, there was no indication that there was a collapsing sinkhole in the area. Uh, could he have done something to have figured it out? Well, short of doing a 
quick ground penetrating radar survey or something, um, he wouldn't have really known. There aren't oftentimes a lot of visible signs. But there he is, he's stuck. Here's a giant one, this occurred in 1962. Uh, the whole thing is about 450 feet across, and it's about uh, 150 feet deep. And it occurred uh, basically uh, after a big, uh, heavy series of rainstorms. And the only thing that saved anybody from disaster is the fact that it occurred out in Shelby County, out in the National Forest area. So there were some trees damaged, but you know, no, no structures. That doesn't always happen. Usually we see sinkholes kind of form in a, in a couple ways. One is they just kind of dissolve from the surface down. And there you kind of see, oh, there's this depression here that's not a good place to build. Or the ones that, that tend to be the problem are these collapsed sinkholes where there's a cavern in the limestone and it's dissolving out. And as the roof becomes unsupported, the roof collapses down into the cavern. And this is a process called stoping. It's a, it's a mining term. And as this process continues, it eventually gets to a point where the overlying sediments are no longer supported by the bedrock. And eventually, uh, it all goes collapsing down into the sinkhole. So this can be uh, you know, supported and be uh, pretty uh, unapparent at the surface for a long time before it starts to, starts to go. Now, oftentimes, you'll kind of start to see a little subsidence going on here. You'll start to see maybe foundations cracking a little bit, or you'll see a road kind of pick up a little extra tilt or a curb kind of tilt. And when you start seeing those kind of things in the limestone area, you ought to start getting suspicious. First of all, don't buy the house that you were going to buy in that neighborhood. Kind of think through it a little more. But if you own a house there, you might want to start kind of looking around and paying attention and seeing if hmm, that ceiling and that underground cavern stoping and am I starting to get to a point where I'm going to go down the sinkhole. Now, sometimes you can use these to your advantage. This is the Arecibo radio telescope. It is the most powerful radio telescope built on Earth. And the, the way it works is this is a reflector dish down here and it bounces the waves back to a receiver up here, which then sends the, the um, feedback down to the computer room. And this is built in Puerto Rico. And to keep the, the development costs down, they actually built this receiver dish uh, within a sinkhole area. And you can kind of see there are other sinkholes kind of sitting back here on the horizon. So they were pretty clever. They used the natural topography of the sinkhole to um, set up this, this receiver dish. Of course, you probably really already know about this place. This was used as the James Bond double or GoldenEye movie. This was Evil Headquarters. And this is where they had the big fight at the end. Another sure. yeah. dish. Not really true. One of the things that we see is where these caverns do have the ceilings collapse. They stope in. And now this cavern is open to, to the surface. Well, it's got water in it. And that water has risen to the water table, right? So we can see the water table exposed, essentially, down in this sinkhole. And in the Yucatan of Mexico, there isn't a lot of rainfall down there. It's actually pretty arid by normal standards. So the Mayan civilization uh, relied upon these sinkholes that basically opened things up to the water table as giant wells for their cities. So the Mayan population developed all along uh, a, a string of these sinkholes, and they are called cenotes. And the cenotes became the center of the big cities in Mayan culture. In Florida, uh, we have what we call 
karst lakes. Sometimes they're called sinkhole ponds. And you can see here ponds in these dark spots. And notice the white lines here. Those are roads of new subdivisions being built in around these karst sinkholes. Uh, everybody wants to have property on the lake, right? That's the big expensive piece of property. So we've got all these sinkholes full of water, perfect place to develop, to put in houses. So as these sinkholes expand, because they're continually dissolving, right? Is this a good place to be building houses? Is the guy in frost proof kind of, his, his karma is showing up here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is kind of like let's find a really bad place to build houses and put them there. Take this process to its ultimate conclusion, where the sinkholes just keep expanding and expanding, and eventually the topography is mostly sinkhole and very little rock surrounding the sinkhole. And here you've got what we call tower cars. And you can see the remnants of the landscape is left as these hills. All of this valley is the sinkhole. And the sinkhole has expanded to where it dominates the topographic surface now. The topographic surface used to be up here at the top of the hills. Now we're <coughs> down at the level of the water table and the sinkholes. And all we're seeing are the knobs of bedrock that the sinkhole hasn't yet claimed. So Tower Cars is kind of just the ultimate uh, end of um, uh, looking at sinkhole development. The, the next thing is, of course, the Tower Cars disappears. Right? So can I get Tower Cars anywhere? The pictures that I just showed are basically from South, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, China. Here's the <coughs> typical area in China of tower carts. Uh, is that the only place that I can get this stuff to work? that show up in Saudi Arabia. That's not wet, but it was at one point. So back geologically, it could form. Now, of course, it's uh, become desert, and uh, it looks kind of out of place. Here you can see this uh, uh, I-94 section by Springfield, Missouri, and they've cut down through the limestone and you notice the caverns that have been exposed uh, in the process of doing this. And you can see here, here's this cavern, and notice the fractures and how we've got a sinkhole on the surface that was forming up there. So here we've got a sinkhole that not only is forming as a cavern subterraneally, but also is a sinkhole just dissolving out of the surface. Will that eventually like break and just crumble down? Yeah, this will this will just collapse. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it'll probably spill out onto the highway now. Before, when it just collapsed down as a hole, uh, but now we'll probably be digging it out of the out of the interstate. And as groundwater flows through these areas, it precipitates out calcium carbonate, or it precipitates out silica. It depends on. Uh, the material that it's running through. But nor normally we see uh, uh, stalactites forming from the ceiling as the water drips off the end 
and when the water splashes on the floor, leaving behind material, it forms a stalagmite. So eventually, as the two connect, they become a column. And as this water drips across the walls, it'll become a curtain. So you see all sorts of these, these forms precipitating out uh, in the caverns. And if you've ever been on a cavern trip, uh, this is part of the beauty of, of the caverns. They, you know, all the cavern tour operators who have colored lights on them and make it really, really pretty well. Yeah. Okay, so if you ever want a great experience, great caving experience, uh, it's not too far away from here, actually. You can go into central to southern Indiana or over into uh, western Kentucky, those, those, that area in particular, uh, down by Louisville. Of course, it's Mammoth Cave. It's one of the fanciest, nicest caves. Uh, the National Park Service uh, operates it, so it's well done. Um, and of course, down by Roswell, New Mexico, and that area is Carlsbad Cavern down toward there. So there's some really pretty cool caves uh, that you can go to. Okay, let's kind of bring it back home a little bit, and let's talk about glaciers. Glaciers, as we all know, are big chunks of ice running across the landscape. And they're doing two things. They're ripping up the landscape, reshaping it, so it's very erosive, and or all that material that they're carrying from this erosive process, they've got to dump back out somewhere. And as they do that, they become big deposition machines. So we really see a couple of different styles of landscape developing with glaciers. One is where it's just scraped everything right down to bedrock and cleaned it off and shaped and sculpted it or three, or two, around here, we see uh, a landscape that's more depositional, where it's laid down sands and gravels, and created a rolling, hilly landscape full of ponds and lakes. Glaciers are nothing new. We tend to think of them as kind of the ice age, kind of the last thing that happened before we entered the area. Yes, but that's just the last one. In reality, we've seen a number of major glacial events going all the way back in the Precambrian. So we see a big event here in the Proterozoic, uh, which is the younger part of the Precambrian, but that's still between two and one billion years ago. We see another fluctuation here right at the Cambrian. Uh, we see Permian. We see, of course, the place to see here. So we see a bunch of these glacial events all the way throughout <coughs> geological history. The one thing that we're seeing is instead of being long-term events and very significant events, we're seeing them not quite as big, but we're seeing them a lot more frequently. Right now, technically, if we look at the cycle, we are just in between glacial events. The last glacier left here, about 10.